Hey everyone, Will Metz here, or Guillaume Metz, for those of you that can uh, speak a little French. Welcome to this YouTube channel, where my goal is to educate and empower aspiring guitarists through their understanding of music theory and fretboard navigation to help them reach their goals and especially become better, more confident players, improvisers, and composers. Today's episode is going to be all about technique. I know technique is something that guitarists are really interested in, and rightfully so. Technique, as we'll see, is one of the main seven elements, sorry, I showed four, seven elements of guitar mastery. Again, in breaking down the mastery of guitar, I believe that there are seven main fields that you need to focus on in isolation and sometimes in compound exercises or in combination, basically, to really master the guitar. Technique is one of them, and it's, of course, really, really important. So we'll talk about what technique is. We'll talk about, you know, of course, the fact that technique is something that relates to the body and coordination, and therefore that we're going to have to talk a little bit about body posture, some stretching exercises, and then, of course, we'll talk about how you can develop better technique through a series of principles and exercises that you can directly implement really quickly and that will allow you to make a lot of progress. Before we get into it, please understand that these videos take a lot of time to make and I am making them available for free to you in their full format over here on YouTube. And so there's a few ways that of course you can support me and the easiest way and the cheapest way, it's actually free, is to subscribe to this channel and hit that little bell thing so that every time I make a new video, you can actually get a notification for it and watch it as soon as possible. This is a huge help, of course. It helps grow my channel, and it's something that's easy for you and free. If you want to support in other ways, there are several ways that you can do that. The first way is to get my two books, Music Theory for the Self-Taught Musician, Volume 1 and Volume 2. Volume 1 covers all the basics of music theory, and volume two covers some more advanced notions and we go deep into the discovery of chord progressions, harmony, improvisation, composition, etc. Remember that I do not come from a formal education. I am a self-taught guitarist myself for the most part. And I figured this all out while I was in engineering school because, well, I'm a nerd and I wanted to dive deep into this and figure it out so that I could finally understand music. But I know what it's like to be on the other side of it. And this is the result of years and years and years of research and study and reading that I am making available to you in these books. All right, without further ado, let's dive right into it. So what is technique? What do people mean by technique? A lot of people refer to it as the ability to play fast, and speed is definitely one lever of technique. Speed is actually a test. If you can play fast, it means that you've probably checked a bunch of technical boxes before. But technique is actually a condition for speed. Essentially, if you don't have good technique or you accumulate a lot of bad habits on the guitar, you'll be able to still play for a little bit. But at some point, if you do want to play faster, or if you do want to play a specific lick that really requires to have a good technique, or left hand and right hand coordination or anything, or finger independence, then you will run into a problem. And that's sometimes when guitarists are like, oh my God, it seems like I can't go past this level or this speed, I can't play this exercise. And then maybe you take some lessons and the, the teacher will tell you, that's because your technique is not good, your form is not good, and therefore you cannot put more pressure on your technique, you can't put more weight on your form and you'll never be able to. You have to go back and debunk those bad habits if you really wanna do that. Now don't worry, if you realize that you do have those bad habits and you're like, oh my God, that's me. I, do I have to go back and start from square one? No, of course, all the things, all the good things that you've learned are still gonna be there, right? But you do have to take a few steps back and slow down a little bit and then kind of fix those little problems here and there but then it won't take you nearly as much time to get back to speed and then you'll finally be able to overcome 
that boundary or that plateau and break it so that you can finally play the way you really want to play. Technique refers to the physical ability to play what you want to play on the instrument. All right, it's one thing to know your scales. It's one thing to know where they are on the fretboard or even how they sound. It's one thing to have good rhythm. But at the end of the day, you got to play. You have a physical part of your body, your hand which is linked to your shoulder, to your neck, to everything over here in your body that needs to perform what you want to play. And that performance comes from training the right muscles, training the right neural connections, right? Training your nervous system and training independence, your ability to be coordinated with the left hand and the right hand, right? This is all very, very physical. You can have all the other elements mastered in those seven fields of guitar mastery, but if you cannot technically play what you want to play, well, you're kind of screwed. Technique is the final piece of the chain, basically, where you're actually transferring all this knowledge and all everything that you want to hear and you know that you really want to express. And finally, it comes down to your fingers being able to play that. And I know how frustrating it is to not be able to do that. I know how frustrating it is to hear something in your mind and then you try to do it and it doesn't sound good or there's a ring, a string that resonates and that you didn't want or, you know, the tone is not right. This is what technique will allow you to do in having good technique. It doesn't necessarily mean speed. You only need as much speed as you want in order to express yourself and to play what you want to play. Everyone knows that speed is not necessary in order to play beautiful solos or to be a great guitarist. Absolutely not. Of course, if you're in certain niches, such as heavy metal, right, you're going to be expected to know how to play fast. And that's totally fine. But in this case, again, if you have good form, speed just requires repetition. It requires taking a metronome and taking your good form and your exercises and slowly increasing the tempo until you get there. It's really not the most difficult, it doesn't take as much time as you would think if the whole foundation underneath it is correct. So because technique is extremely physical, one thing I like to do that I've started doing lately even more as I just turned 30 and I know it's not old for many people, but you know, you start feeling that you're not exactly as endurant or as uh, resistant. And so it became more and more interesting to me to stretch, to get myself ready for a practice session and for a gig, for anything, right? It, and it really does make a huge difference. That's the only reason I started doing it. Before that, I was like, are you kidding me? It's just a guitar. I'm like, seriously, do I need to stretch? Well, it turns out it really does make a difference. One of my friends is like, you should try it out. And I'm going to actually give you some of the, exor the stretching exercises that I've been told are very useful by some friends and mentors. And so this is how it goes. Before you start playing, I recommend, again, remember that guitar is gonna, is gonna start here in the neck and then go all the way in your arms. And depending on if you're standing or sitting, it's gonna be a little bit different. But the most important, again, is to start with the neck. So start with some little kind of side stretches like that. You know, on the guitar, you're always kind of looking this way. And when you're a little stressed out or you're tensed because you're practicing your technique, this whole area of your neck can start hurting. I know mine definitely does with gigging and everything. So just give it a nice stretch, especially on the side like this. And then you can turn around one way, the other. I do about 10 of each, but you know, I'm just showing you over here. You can go up and down like this. Do 10 of each, it's a good rule of thumb. All right, then I'm gonna go ahead and roll my shoulders. I'll roll this one one way, the other, one way, the other, just loosen everything up like that. Then finally, we're gonna keep moving again. We're moving towards our hand. So then we get to the elbow and the forearm. The, my elbow hurts a bit, so I, I like to do this over here and kind of the other way like that on both arms. I could hear a pop there. <laughs> there we go. Then my wrists kind of go both ways like that. I'll also sometimes massage those tendons here. You can see how they move like that. Those tendons get really irritated when you play a lot. So I'll massage these like this, boom. 
and then again the wrists. Now the hands. Well, the hands, of course, are the focus point. So how are we going to stretch our hands? I like to do start with this one over here and go and extend and pull your fingers and then just the thumb. The thumb has a there's a lot of pressure on your thumb when you have good technique. All right, the other hand. And then we'll do some finger splits. So like this, basically. All right, now you can do it on a flat surface or on your knees, but basically you wanna split like this, stretch your fingers on each hand. And then you can also do it like this. So the front splits where you wanna stretch your fingers like that. All right, so do that on both of your hands and then give everything a good shake. Take your pick and you're ready to go. Okay, so now let's talk a little bit about posture and how to hold the guitar properly. Again, you want to put as, as little strain as possible on your body. So how do you do this? There's two main ways that you can really hold the guitar. There is kind of the rock and roll way where you put it on, if you're right-handed, you put it on your right leg like this and your guitar is gonna be, your neck is gonna be straight, mostly kind of parallel to the ground. And then there is also the classical way in which you would put on the left leg and then you would lift that leg a little bit and that's gonna sit on your left leg over here. And the neck in this position is gonna go up at kind of like a 30 degree angle. Now that position is real. if you're gonna do scales and stuff, it's really nice because I feel like you don't have as much of a of this tendency to kind of like pull your shoulder down. I find it more comfortable. The drawback is that live sometimes, depending on what you play, you're not gonna wanna hold your guitar like this, like the jazz musicians, which I will admit I definitely do. Um, but you know, it, it kind of looks a little nerdy. So maybe you want a, a little more of a rock position, more comfortable like this. And in this case, you know, you wanna practice technique the way you're gonna be holding your guitar because it does matter, really does. So however you like to hold your guitar in the real world is how you should practice your guitar. I actually recommend if you're gigging a lot to practice some of your exercises standing up. If you're gonna be playing standing up, practice standing up because it's different, right? You'll notice some things you can do when you're sitting down and when you're standing up that just that little bit of extra angle on your arm, the fact that you have to bend your hand a little bit more this way, you're not gonna have as much fluidity as when you're practicing sitting down. So be careful about it. Now the main elements are, today I'm just gonna do the rock position, but the main elements are again, shoulders should be straight and kind of relaxed. So if you're just kind of like letting go of everything, your guitar should stand like this, and then you just have to put your hand on the fretboard and your elbow should be loose. Put that right arm over here, kind of on this part over here of the fretboard, of the guitar, sorry and let that hand go down, and there we go. You should be able to totally relax and have your hand on the fretboard, and here you're ready to play these strings. I am fully relaxed at this point. There is no tension whatsoever. If you have tension just in the holding, think about how much tension you're gonna get when you start trying to really play fast or you know play these frets or be a little stressed out in the moment. In the moment. Okay, so now let's talk about the basics of technique, okay, with the left hand and with the right hand. Again, there's two main things that you're gonna find yourself playing on the guitar, basically, chords and scales. So you kinda have to practice both when you're practicing technique, and we'll talk about some exercises for both. But again, those two main categories, chords and scales. So when it, let's start with scales, okay? When it comes to scales, you wanna make sure that your fingers are as parallel to the frets as possible. You don't want this weird angle like this. You don't want this weird angle like this. It should be parallel. If it's not parallel, and if you need to kind of find yourself doing some of these weird positioning things, it's you have to go back again. You should be able to relax and put your hand on the fretboard naturally like that and see my, my fingers are parallel to the frets. That's already a good sign. Second thing, your thumb should be in the middle of your fretboard for the most part. There are exceptions. The exceptions are when you get higher over here, you'll see your thumb will naturally kind of stick out because it really takes a lot to put it back in the middle. So when I'm playing down, when I'm playing over here, you'll see my thumb stick out a little bit. Not much though, right? 
you don't want it like this, right? If you're doing it like that, unless you have gigantic hands, right? And it just your thumb kind of naturally sticks out because they're, your, your hands are too big. You should be able to have your hand in the back of your fretboard. And the reason for that is that your thumb, your hand should act as kind of like a, a, a claw, right? You're, you're not just pushing with your fingers, you're squeezing your thumb once you want your thumb to squeeze and help your fingers um, to play the notes. Because if you put all the pressure on your fingers, especially weak fingers like the pinky, you're done, right? So you should always feel like your thumb is helping the rest of your hand and your fingers grip to play the notes, if that makes sense. An exception with the thumb is going to be when you bend. And we're not gonna go really deep into bending in this video, but when you bend, you see how my thumb is on the top over here? That's when you get an excuse to put the bend over here. Or we'll see when you play chords if you wanna play the bass note of the chord with your thumb. Other than that, if you're not bending, or if you're not higher up over here, or if you're not using your thumb to play bass notes, as like in the Jimi Hendrix kind of style, then the thumb should be behind, all right? And you should see that. That's why I said, when, if you wanna get better at technique, practice with a mirror. It's not narcissistic, it's just sometimes it's hard to see those things if you're just looking down here. And also, if you're looking at a mirror, you're not messing up your, your neck over here and you can kind of build an intuition for where your hand is on the fretboard without having to look. It's a great exercise. Practice in front of a mirror, right? There's all sorts of little techniques like that, but that one I really, really recommend, especially when it comes to technique. So again, when I bend, I want my finger, my thumb here because it kind of locks me and allows me to, again, balance out, right? It's the the law of physics, the what is it, the second law of physics of Newton. You want the forces to kind of equalize. And so if you're bending up, you're gonna want something to help push your hand down to balance out the forces. And that's gonna be your thumb. It's gonna lock you in like this. If you did it like this, it's really hard to get as much precision and, etch, and as much strength when you're bending. One of the very important things is you do not want your fingers to bend like this. You don't want, you don't want, you always want your fingers to be kind of pointing like this towards the fretboard, not like, not like this. If you see one of your fingers doing this, there is a problem. That means that you're not putting the pressure in the right direction, okay? An exception would be if you're kind of sweeping like this or if you're barring a chord. But when you're barring a chord or when you're sweeping or rolling your finger like this between two notes, like... Notice that it's, it's not really the same thing. It's not like I'm uncontrollably pushing and my finger does this. I'm choosing to roll it up because I'm sweeping my notes or I'm barring or something like that. All right, some technical exercise will require this. But for the most part, if you're just playing... Fingers will always be pointing towards the fretboard. Now, most of these rules are going to apply for chords. When you play chords, finger, the thumb is in the back, helping the fingers because some chords, especially bar chords, they require quite a bit of strength, right? You're gonna have to develop those muscles. And so, but all the other rules basically apply. So the thumb is gonna be over here behind the fretboard, helping the fingers, except if you want to play the bass notes over here on the low E string with the thumb. So Jimi Hendrix does that a lot. Because that allows him to free up like the pinky, for example. And to be able to play those little effects like that. Totally fine. But again, in this case, you're in control when you do this, right? You're not just accidentally doing this because you have bad technique. You're choosing to do this. And then when you go back to normal chords, notice how even when the chords are complicated, right? You still want that, especially when the chords are complicated. Right, my thumb here is still, I want you to see, right there in the middle. Okay, we're getting there. We're soon gonna look at our chromatic exercise to kind of like, it's gonna be our base exercise for all the technique that we're going to study in this video. First, I wanna talk a little bit about 
what a position means on the fretboard. The position refers to the fact that, you know, on the guitar, you're going to find yourself somewhere on the fretboard, and every time you take a, a new anchor point, say I'm playing a scale and I want to move up to this area. When you move up to an area of the fretboard, there is a finger that's going to act as your main kind of anchor point because it's the strongest finger, and that's your index, all right? And so this index will basically give a name to the to the position that you're in. If my index is on position on fret number seven, I am over here playing in position seven. And I can play a major C major scale, for example, in position seven over here because my index is on this finger. If I wanted to go down, all of a sudden I'm changing position. I'm kind of changing my stance, basically. Now, when you're in a specific position, the rule of thumb is that every finger has its own fret. So your index, if I'm on fret seven, if it's position seven, the index is gonna cover all the notes that are played on fret seven. This finger over here is gonna cover all the frets that are on the eighth fret. The ring finger is gonna cover all the notes that are played on the ninth fret and the pinky, all the notes that are played on fret number 10. With the exceptions of what we call stretches, because sometimes you'll see some scales require you to expand your the span of your finger like that to more than just four frets. And so what you wanna do in this case is you can stretch with your index to get a fret before, or you can stretch with your pinky to grab a fret after over here. But for the most part, so for example, if I'm playing a pentatonic scale where I'm staying in this in these four frets, right? Each finger has its fret. So all the principles and tricks and all the little pieces of advice that I'm going to give you, I'm going to demonstrate with this exercise specifically for scales those six technique levers that i'm going to give you i want you to apply to everything that you are actually practicing as soon as you get you get it basically under your fingers so say you're you, today you're practicing the pentonic scale and first you you have to okay you know it's kind of figure it out a little bit right you can't just put the metronome on and start you know, increasing the tempo if you don't even know where the notes are. So figure out where the notes are, get it under your fingers, and then as soon as you got it on your fingers, you're going to apply all the advice that I'm giving you right now. And it's really gonna skyrocket your technique, I promise you that. So the exercise that we're going to learn is a basic, universal, chromatic exercise. It's very boring in a way, it doesn't sound that good. But that's great because, again, we're trying to train coordination. We're trying to train all our fingers. We're trying to really focus on the physical aspects of what we're doing. And it's actually kind of nice to not get distracted by playing a real scale sometimes. Because if not, you know, I'm a guitarist too. I'm guilty of this. I start practicing and two minutes later I'm noodling and jamming or looking up a, a lick or something like that. So this boring exercise, which I actually think you can make it really fun, right? See it as a game. See it as going to the gym. People that do sports have to go to the gym, even if they're not bodybuilders, just to make their body stronger so that they, they can actually use that strength in whatever it is that they're doing. And, you know, you can go there and always be like, oh, I got to go to the gym. Or just get excited about it. Like, hey, I'm getting stronger. That's awesome. And this is going to actually help me in my discipline. Same thing on the guitar, right? Get stoked about that. And it's fun. It's fun, especially when you start making progress. We're going to use a boring chromatic exercise. You pick a position, really anywhere on the fretboard, just to demonstrate. We'll go with fret number five over here, note A. And the exercise goes like this. It's simple.
So I'm basically playing all the notes in this position. It's not really a chromatic scale per se, because we're, we're kind of jumping some notes each time, but it's a chromatic based, I would say, exercise because it doesn't follow any logic and you're playing a lot of chromaticisms, right? Basically all the notes one after the other. So I'm playing all the notes in this position and you could do it anywhere. So this is a good opportunity for me to talk about the right hand technique. So right hand, there are so many different right hand techniques. There is standard picking, there is chicken picking, there is hybrid picking, there is just finger style, there's all these things. And again, we're not going to focus on all those details today. We don't really have you know, time for all of those. And each of these could require kind of a technical video on the subject. So I'm going to assume that you're using a pick and we're just going to stick to the pick for now. So there's several ways of holding a pick. I like to hold it like this. So basically in the continuity of my thumb, perpendicular, hold it, boom. Now you'll notice that I like to open my hand. Some people play with a closed hand like this. I like to open my hand because for one, I do sometimes like to play with these fingers, like do some sort of hybrid picking. but you can totally just close it if you want. And then I also like, I like to anchor my finger over here sometimes on here. That gives me an anchor point on the guitar and I notice that it just makes me more precise. There's some guitars that will say, well, that makes you slower. I just developed this habit, might be a bad one. And if one day it makes, I realize that it's making me stuck, I'll definitely go, you know, I'll try to debunk that a bad habit. But I haven't found it to be a bad habit per se. Sometimes I'll go like this if I really need to go super, super fast, but this, it doesn't really bother me. And I like it because it allows me to kind of naturally always be able to palm mute, which I love palm muting. And it's an extremely handy thing to do, especially when you have distortion or really, really want that staccato sound, right? So that's just me. You don't have to follow this by all means, you know, whatever works for you. I will say that of all the things that I recommend when it comes to picking, you should start practicing everything that we're gonna see in this video using strict alternate picking, all right? Notice that when I did this exercise, I start with a downstroke and then it goes down, up, down, up. Now, is that the only picking pattern? Absolutely not. Later on, if you want to practice all downstrokes, all upstrokes or hybrid picking, totally fine. But I guarantee that you need to start with strict alternate picking. And the reason for that is again, remember, speed is speed kind of brings out your difficulties in technique and your bad habits. Well, think about how easy it is to play fast like this if you're just going down strokes. Say you, you don't have a coherent picking pattern and you're going kind of down, down, up, down, depending on you know how you feel, just kind of like doing what feels right at the moment. I guarantee that when you get to that speed, not going to be able to do it. Impossible. All right. And then you're going to be like, how do I do that? Um, well, you need to practice straight alternate picking. You can totally do other things after that. Break that rule, do whatever feel. I don't always do strict alternate picking, but I can. And I really recommend that you do this. Picking patterns or legato exercises where you actually don't pick. Those are gonna be one of those levers that I'm going to talk to you about when it comes to those technique levers that you should play with when you're trying to expand your knowledge of a specific scale or mode or anything. But for now, strict alternate picking. Understand that all the things that I'm going to show you with this exercise, the chromatic exercise, one thing you should do is move it up and down the fretboard, right? It feels totally different to play this exercise or any scale up here then over here where your frets are all tiny, and if you have some, you know, if you have big fingers like me, you gotta practice up here. It's not the same. 
And so anytime what everything that I'm going to tell you here, I'm assuming that you're going to bring it up the fretboard, up and down the fretboard. You can practice and go up a half step, go up a half step, go up a half step. You know, I could go. And then go up. And I'm going to do that all the way up. And then I'm good. All right. That's a good exercise. You don't have to do every half step. You could do every whole step. Totally fine. But really, trust me here. When it comes to practicing chords, Again, the principle is kind of the same. Say you're practicing, whatever chord you're practicing, major chords, minor chords, bar chords, the goal is going to be to move it, move it up and down the fretboard, right? Here I'm going between an E shape major and an A shape major. You can do E, A, and D shapes. Right, the goal here is not to think about which notes you're playing or what navigation tool you're using. We're, we're practicing technique in isolation. You need to isolate things sometimes when you really want to make some big bursts of progress. So. Don't think about the ear training and the everything at the same time. This is technique. I don't care what chord I'm playing. I just want to be able to physically play these chords and then move them up and down the fretboard, if that makes sense. Okay, so it's time for me now to tell you all those technique levers, the six technique levers that I use and that I've taught all my students and that really, I mean, they really, they're incredible. They'll help your technique, they'll help your coordination, and they're actually even gonna help your navigation skills and your knowledge of the shapes of each scale or mode that you're practicing because of the way that they work neurologically. And so without further ado, let's dive into it. If you're still watching again, and if you like that video, please subscribe to my channel, it helps me a lot, and let's get going. Okay, so one thing that I haven't talked about yet because I, it's so obvious that I forgot to say it almost. There is no such thing as a technique exercise without a metronome, all right? If you're practicing technique without a metronome, you're not practicing technique, forget about it. You need to use a metronome. You need a way to be accountable in terms of rhythmic tightness and to be able to monitor your progress to know what speed you're playing at, all right? So you need a metronome. Once you get comfortable with the metronome, you can also use a drum groove because metronomes, they can get a little boring. I get that. But the metro, there's something about the metronome. Every musician that knows what they're doing will agree. That just puts you into this zone where you really focus. You're not distracted by the funky drum groove or anything. You're just trying to keep time, play better, play tighter. And it's really important. I think it's something to do with the fact that, again, there's very few distractions in a metronome. It's just a simple click, click, oh, you're too early, ah, you're too late, right? It's this very unforgiving, but yet just teacher or coach that's gonna help you make your progress. All right, the other thing is I want you to practice at what I call a calibrated speed. So again, think of the example of the gym, right? If you're gonna start a new movement, if you're gonna start squatting, you're not gonna do it with 250 pounds. You actually are going to do it with nothing, right? You're going to just work on the movement very lightly. And again, speed on the guitar equals kind of weight at the gym. So if you're wondering, okay, well, how slow? Here's a rule of thumb. Slower than you think, okay? Everyone starts and they're like scrambling, blah, blah, and I'm like, no, slower, slower. And I'm like, well, that's boring. I'm like, I don't care. You can't do it at that speed. You sound bad. The only way you'll sound good is if you slow down a little bit and then in a few days you get back up to that speed. You gotta also know what to listen for, right? What are you looking for? What does it mean that you're ready to speed up? You're ready to speed up when your form is proper, you're not super tense, all the things that I talked about are verified, you're not you know, bending your fingers the wrong way. The sound is clean, it's clear, there's no fuzzy string. There is no kind of, you know, 
unwanted little muteness or something like that. If you're playing chords, all the strings should resonate one after the other. Right? Nope. Not, none of that stuff or no like like half half sounding notes same with with scales or modes or you know m melodic tools basically nice and clean good tone good articulation a lot of times at it, it, it first it's like none of that slower let it ring second finger third finger fourth finger etc notice how i'm adding fingers one after the next I'm not bouncing around like that right you're trying to make the minimal amount of movements you want to save your energy good technique looks seamless your fingers are barely moving if you're start if you're jumping around like this that's not good some of this is going to you know sort itself out as time goes and you keep practicing because your brain will realize oh well, this is too much movement let me trim it trim it down a little bit so that i save energy but you there's a lot that you can do just by being aware of this and consciously trying to really preserve your energy have nice form fluid movements one of the metaphor i give it's like walking right when you're walking you're not just jumping like that from one step to the next, it's fluid. You put the next step and then you just lift your leg and now you have full pressure on this leg for a little bit. It's the same here. You play, you add the finger, you play, you slowly release a bit of the tension. But again, you don't necessarily want to release all the tension because the previous fingers that you're putting on here help your weaker fingers over here play. So when I'm playing this, I'm actually almost keeping the tension on all of my first fingers so that when I'm playing with my pinky, I'm actually squeezing with my whole hand, right? It's not just my pinky and my thumb like this. I'm squeezing with my whole hand. One of my guitar teachers, Pascal Vigny, said that you should basically always think that you're playing as if you were playing legato. Even when you're doing like strict alternate picking, it should look like when you're... It should look like when you're playing legato. When you're playing legato, you actually have to keep all those fingers. You need to have proper balance and technique because you're not picking. You don't have the right hand to help you play the notes. So it really forces you to have that good technique. So get an idea for what this looks like, right? Your technique, if you're practicing in front of a mirror, look at proper technique. Right? That's what you're aiming for. Okay, so first lever, lever number one, time division. It's one of the most important. If you can't play in time, you can't play. So that's why you need a metronome and then you need to start practicing your exercise. Again, as soon as you have it under your fingers, start tweaking between different time divisions, okay? Start slow, like 60 beats per minute, and then play in eighth notes, play in quarter notes. Start introducing triplets, 16th notes. Now understand that the time division will change the speed. So if you're trying to play slow, you probably won't be able to go much past the eighth note. So do half notes, quarter notes, eighth notes. But rhythm is an essential part of technique, linking your rhythmic brain to your physical abilities, being able to play tight in time with a consistent flow of notes at whatever time division you're choosing is crucial, all right? So here is, for example, I'm gonna demonstrate everything here using the chromatic exercise. And a pentatonic scale, because I know, you know, this way it'll feel a little more real, closer to a scale you're actually going to be practicing. Remember, you can apply all these principles to everything, but A minor pentatonic is a scale that guitarists know pretty well. So I'll do the exercise with the chromatic exercise and the pentatonic scale. Okay, so here's a metronome at 80 beats per minute. So we're going to start a chromatic exercise in quarter notes, every beat. Now I'm going to play it in 
eighth note. Now I'm going to switch it up, right? Practice switching between a time division and the other so that you can immediately switch your flow of notes accurately. Let's try some triplets. That's how you practice different time divisions. Let's look at what that looks like with a pentonic scale, A minor pentonic. Take this up and down the fretboard, and you're good. Second lever, accents. Accentuation can mean several things. Usually an accent can be a note that's played louder, a note that's played shorter, a note that's played longer than the others. Essentially anything that makes a note stand out from the rest of the notes or the normal flow of notes. For this exercise, we're going to talk mostly about the louder aspect, right? So accentuating basically by playing the note a little harder on your right hand, right? Whether it's a downstroke or an upstroke, that's going to depend on where you place your accents. Because remember, we're using strict alternate picking. So if my flow goes down, up, down, up, and I put an accent on even number of notes, or sorry, on odd numbers of notes, no even number of notes, so every two notes, four notes, then the accents are going to be all downstrokes. Even every four. Notice that I'm palm muting the other notes to really even further emphasize the note that I'm accentuating. And it's a good way for you to practice your palm muting. Right? This is what creates dimension into a solo, really being able to accentuate the notes that you want and then kind of mute the other ones a little bit is what makes gives a solo some texture. This is what people call dynamics as well. Right, It doesn't take much to really make a huge difference. So accentuate every one note, two notes, three notes, four notes, and vary between even accents, so you accentuate every two or four, or odd numbers. And by switching this and the time division, and depending on the number of fingers that you have on each string with the tool that you're practicing, it's gonna make your brain hurt a little bit. And that's a good thing, right? When you're practicing technique, you want either your hands to hurt a bit, your brain to hurt a bit or your coordination, right? You want to feel like your nervous system is trying to figure something out and it's, trying, it's like, okay, this is weird. I need to get better at doing this, right? At executing different unusual coordination patterns and things like that. So here's what that chromatic exercise would sound like if I accentuate every two notes. I'm at 80 beats per minute. Let's go in eighth notes every two notes. Let's do it in eighth notes, but every three notes. So it's gonna give me kind of a triplet feel, even though I'm still playing um, eighth notes, and it's gonna force me to switch between downstroke and upstrokes with my accents. Tonic scale, every three notes would sound like this, for example. Cool, lever number three. Lever number three has to do with picking or lack of picking, which would be legato. 
So in this case, you're actually going to, and that's again, I recommend only playing with this lever later on, once you're comfortable with alternate picking. But there, you can actually start maybe playing all downstrokes or all upstrokes or two downstrokes, two upstrokes, hybrid picking. There's all these techniques that are incredible that you can leverage. And then you can actually start not picking, which would include, which would imply legato, such as hammer-ons and pull-offs. You could do all hammer-ons or two notes picked and then the two, you know, the two later, the two last fingers with a hammer. There's so many different co combinations over here, right? So picking patterns. We all know those techniques, hammer on, pull offs, downstrokes, upstrokes, but start with alternate picking. Lever number four, and that's one of my favorite ones. If you notice, the first three levers were more on, they're more oriented towards rhythm. We didn't really change the order of the notes that we were playing. It's all the rhythm, the accents, you know, the right hand, left hand, or hammer ons, pull offs. Now we're gonna start tweaking the groups or the order of the notes that we're playing. So rather than just playing the tool linearly, A, B, Z, D, E, F, G, etc., we're going to go up a specific number of notes or skip some notes here and there. And that is absolutely crucial because for one, you wanna be able to do this to make melodies that are interesting, right? There's ways to make interesting melodies without a system like that, but just kind of having good ideas and having good ear. But knowing some systems on how to play specific, how to tweak a tool that's linear at first and change the order in a systematic way to open up your melodic ideas is very useful. So the first thing we're gonna talk about is note groupings. So again, I want you to kind of think about this exercise as if we're numbering the notes, right, in order from this first note with one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, 10, right? There's we're really going up the notes and numbering them. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna go up a specific number of notes, say three, which would mean groups of three. So we're gonna go one, two, three, all right? And then we're gonna go back to the second note, so the note after the one we started with, so which is this one here, and go up another three notes. And then we start here on the third note and go up three notes. Start on the pinky, go up three notes. And now we're back on our index here, go up three notes. That's what we call groups of three. You can also reverse these groups and play, for example, rather than going up three notes here, you reverse that pattern. So you play the same thing, but every little cell of three notes you go from the top note to the bottom note. So it looked like this. Groups of four would look like this. Right, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. And the reverse would look like this. practicing without the metronome now you're probably like well technique exercise without metronome is not technique that's true but I'm not practicing right now I'm demonstrating and um, again this since we're not talking about rhythm I just want to focus here on the groupings and what I'm actually doing how I'm tweaking the order of the notes so for a pentonic scale it would sound like this in groups of three <laughs> Reverse would sound like this. Super cool. You can already tell, oh, it sounds like a melody, right? There's already some originality behind the, what I'm doing over here. It's not as linear and boring. And, and especially when you start adding the accents or tweaking the rhythm, right? You understand that you can play with these levers, with different levers at the same time. And the more levers you try to play with at the same time, the harder it can be. But the closer it becomes to something, you know, very melodic, something you're actually going to be using, and the more progress you're going to do. 
Don't make it too hard, right? Isolate first, but then after a while, you can play with these levers, um, with different levers at the same time. Okay, we're almost there. Lever number five, note skipping. So again, if I number my notes, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, etc., I'm going to start with the first one and skip a number of notes. Two, one, two, three. Let's say I skip one note. So essentially I'm starting with this one, skipping the second note, and just going straight to the third one. One, three. Then I start again with the note right after the one I began with in my sequence, which is note number two over here, the one I skipped. And then I skip this one, the one that's after the one, so the note number three. Right? And again, I'm gonna, there's gonna be PDFs with all that linked to this video, so don't worry if you're a little confused, it's gonna be explained there. So I could skip two notes and go straight to the pinky here, and then. And I can reverse my skippings like I did, so go maybe like this. Right, so here I'm skipping one note, but going in reverse. Now again, on the chromatic exercise, doesn't look necessarily that amazing, but if you do it to a pentonic, here's what it's gonna sound like. I'm gonna skip one note. And now I'm gonna reverse this. If I skip two notes, it's, it looks like this. Pretty cool, right? I mean, if you're going to play a solo like this and you start doing that stuff, you know. skipping. So in this case, we're actually just purposely going to another string when we're not supposed to. So for example, I could start here and say, okay, I'm going to play two notes and then I'm going to skip a string and play two more notes, two more notes of my tool. So let's go back to the chromatic one. I could play those two and then go to the next string. To the or even skip another string so I could go and then the last two so here I'm I'm really only not skipping a string I'm going to the next string but then I could skip two strings and go skip the a string that starts becoming a little difficult you could skip as many as you want Right now, that's a little. You, now you can also just go the full four notes and then skip a string, so it would look like this. Notice how every time I go back, right? So I'm going here, skipping the A string, then starting on the A string, skipping the D string. All right, I could skip every note, so go kind of diagonal like this. skip an extra string and with the pentonic it sounds like this for example let's say every two notes I skip a string it would look like this or something like that There are so many different options, but you get the idea. All right, guys, here we are. That's it. Those are all the technique levers that I pretty much use all the time. So anytime I'm discovering a new tool, again, think about this whole kind of process. You have your stretching, you get yourself ready. You have the few rules of posture, of hand positioning, etc. Then you say, okay, I'm gonna practice my major scale. Let's go, major scale. You pick a position and you say, okay, I'm gonna practice this position here. Something like that. First thing, get it under your fingers, all right? 
Second thing, put on a metronome at a calibrated speed and start playing it linearly, right? At that speed with a specific and consistent time division. Then you start playing with some of these levers. Oh, I'm going to switch to time division. Okay, back to normal. Oh, I'm going to switch to accents. Back to normal. Oh, I'm going to switch this. Switch all these levers. And then when you get more comfortable, what do you do? You can speed up a little bit. I'm like, okay, I'm good there. I'm going to speed up. See if I can add more weight. Yes? Awesome. Stay there for a bit. Play with the levers again. Play with two levers. Oh, this time I'm going to do time divisions and accents. You'll see. It's going to make you think. You're going to struggle at the beginning. But that's where you want to be. You're making progress in technique if you're able to do what you're practicing, but you're uncomfortable enough that you're actually in a zone where your brain is like, uh-oh, I need to do some rewiring here because this is kind of weird. I'm not used to it, so I got to do some work, right? So you have to be in that sweet progress zone where it's not totally impossible. We're putting too much strain on the technique you don't yet have, but you're still able to be uncomfortable enough to generate progress, okay? And you will get to feel that by yourself. Everybody's a little bit different. But remember, usually it's a little slower than you think. Be um, perspicacious. I think that's how you say it in English, right? Perspicace. Be perspicacious about what you're asking yourself in terms of quality. You want your notes to sound good, your tone to be good, to ring well, right? You don't want to just be like, okay, I sort of got it. Speed up, right? It's not gonna, it's not gonna work like that. Take your time, practice technique efficiently using all the tools that I just gave you. There's gonna be a PDF again that's associated with this video in the description that'll guide you through all those things. I'm giving it to you for free once again. If you want to support one more time, please subscribe to the YouTube channel. It really, really helps. I'm trying my best to. Um, break down the science of playing the guitar for you. This episode is about technique. As you know, I'm mostly of a music theory guy, but I think it's important to have basics. I mean, it's crucial to have basics of technique moving forward. And let me know if you have questions in the comments or any feedback. I really appreciate it. I will read all the comments. And in the meantime, take care, have fun out there, and I wish you uh, good luck with those technical exercises.